Welcome everyone. I'm Hannah Evans. I'm the Oxford Business Alumni Network Manager. I'm delighted that you can join us for a, a, a conversation around enabling energy transition and developing Asia and other related topics. Um, this is part of our energy sector series um, and uh, we will be continuing to do this uh, and more details will be coming soon. So no further ado, I am going to pass over to Jimmy Ja, who you, many of you know, um, has been helping us uh, run these conversations and he will introduce the session and our guest. Well, thank you, Hannah. Um, and it's a pleasure to be back and to talk with you and to spend some time with Murphy here. Um, like Hannah said, this is part of the alumni-led energy-focused conversations for the OBA network that's produced by Said Business School and the University of Oxford. Um, and it's open to students, alums, and friends from all over the world. I, as a alum, I am MBA 2008-2009, and I currently work in climate finance. I'm also an energy entrepreneur. I teach at MBA programs, and I'm a writer. And within four weeks, I will be a returning DPhil student at Oxford. So looking forward to being back within the spires of the city. A bit of housekeeping, please keep yourself muted and microphones, cameras off. This, sex, this session will be recorded for later use and we can find it in our, um, on YouTube afterwards as well, along with the previous episodes and the previous uh, recordings that we've done. Please use the question and answer function within Zoom at the bottom of your screen. We will be answering the questions uh, live over the course of the conversation, so um, the, just, ask it as they come up. And with no further ado, here is our guest today with his Murthy Nooney, founder of the Marshall Group, Marshall Funds, that's based in London, Singapore, Mumbai, and Ho Chi Minh City. And he right now is currently in Vietnam. He did his MBA at the Indian Institute of Management at Ahmedabad and a private equity certificate at Said Business School. And so let me just kick it off. When we did our preparation call, Murthy, a couple months ago, one of the comments that you said was that capital is in London and the projects are in Southeast Asia and that the appetite for project is really huge. So how did you find yourself in this role and how did you find this opportunity? Great. Uh, thanks a lot, Jimmy. Uh, thanks everyone for joining this uh, uh, excellent uh, uh, event here. Um, Okay, uh, uh, I'm presently based in uh, Vietnam. Uh, I've been here uh, since uh, f February, uh, my, uh, and after that, uh, you know, the, the travel was not possible. So uh, we're busy here building our renewable energy projects. Um, okay, um, my, my background, I'm a mechanical engineer from uh, IIT Madras uh, in India. And uh, as we said, I'm on the bar and private equity certificate as well. Um, I've started business uh, that is Marshall Funds in 1996 after working for investment banks in uh, Mumbai and the Middle East. Um, and my initial focus was investing in software sector in India because I, I, I felt that that was the best sector to invest in, very small base and high growth in India. Uh, and that was very successful. And then I moved on to set up a global tech venture fund uh, based in Singapore. So I've been based in Singapore from 2000 to, to, to 2010. And uh, over the years, I set up other, other fund management businesses as well. I set up a hedge fund, for, which is uh, like a long shot hedge fund for India, uh, which is still, still very much operational, uh, managed from Mumbai uh, by my colleagues. Uh, so, we, so I've been running these fund management businesses uh, from Singapore, Mumbai uh, from 2000 to 2010. And in 2010, I moved to London uh, basically to, to expand our business, to get into more business areas. And uh, one of the things I, 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 I started doing was uh, helping uh, Indian uh, entrepreneurs uh, looking for technology in wind power and solar power in, in, from Europe, uh, because uh, your, your Europe, particularly Germany, uh, has been developing uh, the both wind and, wind and, and solar power uh, technologies were all originating from uh, Germany or Denmark, uh, both in wind power and solar power. And, and thereafter, the manufacturing has moved to China. Um, but uh, because of Chinese competition, a lot of, uh, a lot of facilities were, uh, were, were available for sale in uh, Germany. And uh, we were looking to buy a lot of some of these technologies uh, for 
invest them into India. So what we what we were thinking about is uh, a significant fall in technology costs in, uh, in that is power generation costs uh, by way of solar and wind, uh, and then this this technology being affordable uh, in Asia, and the, the need for this technology is the, the, these uh, power generation businesses uh, in in Asia because this is where uh, there is growth, there's need for energy. Uh, and uh, uh, there are other issues like uh, pollution and uh, uh, you know significant investments in coal, which uh, has to stop at some point. So, the, so that that is how we've uh, I've moved into uh, renewable energy uh, technology investments and uh, then power generation and power generation into Asia. That's great. Why don't you tell us some of the highlights of your projects of the wind developments that you're working on and. Uh... Give us a bit of background yeah. of that. Shall I go through the presentation? Uh, please do. Please uh, okay, do. Okay. Okay. Great. <laughs> I have a few slides out here just to uh, outline uh, how our business has evolved and uh, what what we are uh, trying to do. Uh, okay. Um, Jimmy, can, can you see the slides? Uh, You're sharing uh, the presentation view at this point. I, I see your slides. Uh, uh, I see your PowerPoint, not the slides. PowerPoint. Slide. Okay. Sorry. Um, um, you may have to unshare yeah, screen. Okay. Start the presentation yeah. and share screen, or, or this is fine too. Yeah. Oh, okay. You okay. Well, I, I'm just uh, go ahead, go ahead, just yeah. Okay. So, so we we set up uh, the, uh, a business called Marshall Global Renewable Power. Uh, this is incorporated. This company is incorporated in Singapore. This is uh, IPP for uh, Asia Pacific uh, investments into renewable energy, wind, and solar projects uh, in Asia Pacific. This we we set up uh, three years ago, and we are developing renewable energy projects, wind and solar projects in uh, Asia Pacific to, through this company. Uh, so uh, about our, uh, I've already men mentioned about how businesses evolved uh, from uh, technology investments, fund business into renewable energy. Uh, so uh, we, uh, the, um, the renewable energy business, in, initially we were uh, investing into uh, India, both in technology manufacturing uh, of turbines of uh, 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 solar PV projects, uh, and uh, over the last uh, ten years, particularly uh, after uh, Prime Minister Modi has uh, taken over, uh, he has uh, made the sector extremely uh, attractive for foreign investors to invest, and it has been extremely successful. A uh, lot of uh, investments and uh, capacity has come up in in India, the for following China, uh, and the the. Uh, PPA prices have come down. It's become a very competitive business. Um, and uh, well, th there is enough uh, capacity already installed in, 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 in India. Uh, so we, we felt that uh, we, we should pick up uh, some of these uh, uh, technic and te technologies and uh, um, uh, capabilities uh, from India into Asia Pacific. And we started looking around for opportunities in Asia Pacific. Um, and uh, in in Asia, we we uh, we, we find that uh, uh, in Southeast Asia, uh, the, there is significant growth in electricity, electricity generation, growth in economy, growth in electricity generation, and significant investments in coal power, which is which is still continuing. So yeah, as you can see here, uh, Southeast Asia has the maximum had the maximum growth in uh, coal power generation projects in 2018. And it continues in 2019 and 20. Uh, and within Southeast Asia, we found that uh, uh, Vietnam is having uh, double-digit growth in electricity demand. It's one of the few countries in the world having double-digit growth in electricity demand, uh, electricity uh, because of relocation of, of, of manufacturing facilities from China. Um, at the same time, there is uh, no uh, solar wind projects still 2017. This, in fact, there, is, there was not even a policy. Uh, for investment into solar and wind projects. And they have to do it at some point because 
uh, they cannot go on investing in coal power uh, and uh, also financing is not available for coal, coal power going forward. Most of the international banks are not funding coal power anymore. Uh, so the, that's why we felt that uh, there is a great opportunity in, in VCAM to help the country to uh, move out of uh, coal power and uh, coal power generation um, and fossil fuels and move into uh, wind and solar. So the first policy uh, has come up uh, has, uh, back in 2018, 2017, 18. They've they've come up with the uh, policies for uh, solar power investments, PPA for solar power, PPA for wind power, and uh, we, we've been here since then, and uh, we are presently developing a few projects here. Um, and uh, so, uh, in in Southeast Asia, this is an, this is an interesting chart talking about uh, uh, sustainable development. Uh, so, uh, if, if you see this chart, um, the, you will continue to have fossil fuel investments, growth in uh, CO2 uh, generation uh, till 2040, uh, and uh, even as per stated uh, policy objectives, every, every country has stated objectives now of uh, reducing pollution and uh, investing less in uh, fossil fuels and investing more in, uh, in uh, wind and solar. But um, the need here is so much, uh, like in, 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 in most of the Western countries, uh, investment in the new solar power, new renewable energy power is for the replacement of fossil fuels. In Asia, it is not for replacement, it's for growth. So, <laughs> so uh, if, like for instance, in, in, in Vietnam, uh, uh, the, the current power generation capacity is about, uh, for, about, about uh, 50 gigawatt. Uh, this has to, has to be 100 gigawatt by, two, by 2030. So in 10 years time, uh, because of the growth in power generation, the power generation capacity has to double. Uh, so um, well, a, a lot of, as per the current plans, uh, they will continue to invest in coal power unless uh, investors like us and international investors, uh, in international agencies uh, come here and uh, help them to uh, to move out of, to invest more in renewable energy and uh, become less dependent on coal power. Uh, and it, it, to, to some extent, uh, they are forced to do this now because uh, most of the international banks are not investing, not investing in uh, coal power anymore. Even uh, Japan and South Korea have taken decision, decision recently that none of their banks will fund uh, coal power projects, thermal projects uh, outside of Japan as well. Uh, so, uh, this is uh, uh, a plan by International Energy Association, uh, according to them, uh, if, uh, the, if there is significant investment in uh, solar and wind, uh, as you can see in the chart here, uh, in Southeast Asia, you can actually limit uh, the seawater generation to the same level as it is today. So, so, the, so for this, uh, the, you probably need to get to like 70% uh, of the new power generation to be coming from solar and wind. And uh, that is what we are trying to do uh, in, uh, in, in, in South Asia and, and, and in Vietnam. Uh, so uh, the projects that we are developing at the moment, there is a, a, so, a wind solar project we're developing in uh, a province called Angyal province. It's about 167 megawatt, uh, $120 million in investment. Uh, this is uh, close to the Cambodia border, which is also very important because uh, there is an interconnection of uh, power um, uh, transmission line um, going into Cambodia. So if we have excess power in Vietnam, we can actually export to Cambodia. Uh, and the, the second project we're developing is a 125 megawatt near shore wind project. Uh, this is uh, the project is, is in the shallow waters of uh, Mekong Delta. Uh, so the, this is the yellow block is our project. Uh, so we have about 3,200 hectares of uh, water surface allocated for our project. Uh, we plan to uh, 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 install about uh, 30 turbines in this location of uh, four and a half to five megawatt uh, capacity, uh, total capacity of uh, 125 megawatts. So this is our first phase and then uh, we can further expand into the sea uh, as uh, uh, demand increases uh, uh, as, as we, um, have uh, in, in future years, uh, depending on the transmission capacity and all that. So the, in the district that where we are developing our project, uh, district in uh, Binchai province, it's called, uh, there are five projects. So one of the projects is, is by us and other projects are being developed by other developers. 
uh, so a private equity firm fund from Singapore and uh, uh, a, a few Thai developers, uh, they're investing in the other projects. So they, this is the play that we have uh, and uh, we, we hope to uh, help uh, Vietnam over the years uh, to uh, get into more of a renewable energy and uh, become less dependent on fossil fuels. That's great, thank you. Could you go back to your uh, fourth slide? Uh, where you were showing the different um, developments. Yeah. Right. Uh, yes, this one? Uh, one more up. Uh, one more. Uh, you uh, have numbered yes. as slide three. Yeah. yeah I wanted to there. ask yeah. for renewable energy versus the fossil fuel developments, yes. is yes. capital abundant or scarce for the types of projects that you're developing? And also, did COVID change the availability of capital for the pursuit of these projects? Right. Um, so over the last uh, couple of years, uh, it has already become quite evident here uh, that um, international banks, uh, multinational banks are not interested in funding uh, coal projects, thermal projects. So uh, the, the only funding that is going to come is from China. Uh, and uh, uh, there is a lot of concern here that the Chinese are sending uh, secondhand equipment and it is uh, already polluting. Uh, so the uh, and there is a lot of awareness among people that uh, they do not want to have uh, these polluting projects within their neighborhood. So in some cases, uh, some of the village people uh, actually protested uh, and uh, they had to stop uh, a, a, the development of a thermal project. Mm -hmm. So that 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 restriction continues uh, as far as development of uh, thermal projects are concerned. Um, uh, then, uh, if for uh, these large-scale uh, uh, projects, uh, the other possibility is the LNG. Uh, so a lot of uh, LNG projects are being planned as well, uh, but the LNG projects are very expensive and take long time to develop. So it, it, then you need an LNG terminal, and each project is like uh, you know, three, four, five, five uh, billion dollars. Um, but uh, several of these projects are being planned uh, with, with the possibility of uh, uh, importing LNG from the USA. Uh, but that will take time. Uh, in the meantime, the, the capacity which can come up quickly is uh, solar and wind projects. Uh, the, the first solar uh, PPA tariff, which has been announced in 2017-18, has been extremely successful here. So they, they expected about uh, uh, 900 megawatt of uh, capacity to come up in 2019. They actually had four and a half gigawatt. Uh, so there is uh, enough interest from international investors uh, to invest into renewable energy projects here. Um, but financing wise, um, the PPA is not considered as bankable by international, international banks. So that is a big concern here mm -hmm. uh, because the uh, P PPA is not guaranteed by the government. Uh, so it is a commercial decision uh, investors will have to take that uh, this country needs power and uh, if we produce power, they will buy it. They'll have to buy it. So, so that, that, is the, that is how investors will have to think about it. Uh, it is not a uh, must-run must facility like in Germany or India for that matter. It is, uh, renewable energy is not treated as a must-run must facility. So there is a, a bit of a flaw in the PPA here. Uh, so, so, the, so if, yeah. If you can elaborate a little bit, then in Vietnam, what is considered, uh, you know, the, the bankable power sources? Are they building other developing fossil fuel plants? Are they developing hydro plants that then where the PPAs are guaranteed? No, uh, in the past, uh, they were they had guaranteed uh, pro, uh, foreign investment uh, into uh, both hydro as well as uh, uh, thermal projects as well. So AES from the USA has a very big project here. So something like uh, the two gigawatt and they're expanding into four gigawatt. Uh, their project is guaranteed by the government. Uh, but th that was like, uh, uh, that was initiated five, five, five years ago, when, well, five or seven years ago when the country really needed power and needed foreign investment. Uh, but now uh, the government has taken the decision that uh, they will not guarantee, uh, provide guarantee for, uh, uh, for, for, for the projects. So, uh, the lending is not guaranteed uh, mm. by the government. So it's been a recent uh, so change. This, yeah, there's this been, this been a change over the last three years. Uh, so they want to have commercial PPAs, uh, commercial arrangements with uh, commercial investors. Uh, so the, the, but the, the 
yeah, the PPA price they're coming up with is quite attractive. So that's why uh, even though the PPA is not considered bankable because there's no guarantee as well as uh, there is uh, no guarantee of no curtailment. So, so it, it is not a must-run facility. Uh, uh, so therefore, uh, it is not considered bankable by foreign investors. Uh, gotcha. But the, the way we, we are looking at it is uh, we believe that uh, uh, Vietnam will need power. Uh, and uh, if we produce power, uh, they will have to buy it. Uh, they will buy it. So that's, that's why we, we, we are happy to invest in the sector, invest mm -hmm. in Vietnam. So Ben Watson is uh, sent over a question in the chat, which is asking, mm -hmm. are the large corporates signing up to these PPAs or are they the power companies signing up to the large PPAs? A lot of the renewable energy developments in the US was driven by the Microsofts and the Googles who wanted to go into those power purchase agreements. Are you, what are you seeing on the buyer side of the energy that you generate? So uh, as of now, uh, in Vietnam, uh, there's only one, one power generation company, uh, which is the government power generation company called EVN, the city of Vietnam. Uh, they, uh, they are the power producer as well. Uh, they own almost more than 50% of the generation capacity uh, in Vietnam, and uh, they are the sole power distributor. Uh, so uh, there's no one else uh, who can uh, buy power and distribute at this time. Uh, so, uh, so that that situation uh, is is still there, uh, but uh, they have they are coming up with a policy called DPPA, which is a direct PPA. Uh, so uh, corporations uh, can sign direct PPAs with the producers, and uh, they 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 will they'll have a willing charge uh, to the uh, to the transmission the, the transmission agency, which is the LCD Vietnam's uh, transmission network. Uh, so that that policy is the, is in works. Uh, they, it should come up pretty soon. Uh, perhaps next year they should have the DPPA in operation, and we're all waiting for we're waiting for that. Uh, yeah, there are a lot of uh, uh, manufacturing facilities of uh, say Intel, Samsung, uh, and uh, many other tech companies here, uh, and they are eager to take advantage of this kind of direct PPA. Yeah, we were talking about how Samsung was a significant component of Vietnam's GDP with, with all the manufacturing that they do, right? Right, absolutely. So, uh, so Samsung has been extremely successful here in, in Vietnam. So they, they have like uh, to almost 200,000 employees. So, they, so they, they came in here about, uh, about 10, 12 years ago and uh, I understand that they got a sweetheart deal from the government. Uh, they pretty much don't pay taxes for a very, very long time. Uh, but uh, they invested in huge capacities. Uh, they developed uh, several uh, special economic zones, so industrial zones, specifically catered to Samsung and the, their, their subsidiaries, and they provide huge employment. Uh, they they form almost like 40% of the of the exports from Vietnam. So about 40, 40, 45 billion dollars worth of exports uh, are from uh, Samsung only. Uh, and oh. uh, the, uh, and they've invested about some fifteen billion dollars, and we're uh, running at the rate of three four billion dollars a year. There, so the latest uh, iPhone screens are manufactured in Vietnam. Latest Samsung phones are manufactured in Vietnam. So it's, so it's, so it's a uh, big, very successful facility. Wow. We're having a couple of questions come through now. Amy Henry asks, "What is the role that this traditional energy company is playing in?" developing the renewable energy markets or are they helping develop it or are they trying to resist it? Uh, so for, uh, firstly, they, they need it uh, because uh, there is, that there is uh, every year they need uh, at least five to 10 gigawatt of power generation capacity coming up in Vietnam. They need that kind of capacity for the next 10 years. And there's no other uh, power source which is going to generate that kind of capacity in, uh, very quickly. Uh, so, uh, so solar, solar power and wind power is needed here. Uh, they are supporting, uh, but uh, they have uh, one big limitation, uh, which is the uh, transmission lines. So uh, renewable energy requires uh, uh, intermittent, because it's intermittent energy, it's not continuous. So, so it, comes, uh, it comes out only during the day for, for the solar and, the, and then there is wind for wind, wind power. Uh, so it's not continuous power. Uh, so you need a lot of redundant uh, transmission line capacity so that power can flow freely from uh, generation source to consuming source, consuming source 
uh, very quickly uh, in an efficient manner. For that, uh, you need uh, a, a lot of generation capacity, so which, which for which a lot of investment is required. Uh, it's it's not happened yet. So this is very much like uh, uh, India uh, uh, 10, 15 years ago. Uh, but in, India has, has developed a lot of uh, renewable energy capacity and they, they have also developed green corridors. Uh, so uh, su supplying power from green power generation uh, sources uh, to uh, the consuming sources. Uh, so th that still, that investment uh, still has to come, in, come into play. Uh, so unless they have that, it will be difficult for them to absorb a lot of renewable power. So that, that's a problem. And, and the, uh, at least now, um, the pricing is still high for the, for the renewable energy. Uh, so uh, so they basically the EVN uh, is able to charge the consumer about uh, seven cents, but they're paying nine cents to uh, for to solar power and wind power uh, for the first set of projects. But over time, they'll come down and uh, it'll, it'll get cheaper. Great. Let's talk about the flow of capital a little bit. Yuzar Beg asks the question of what are some of the financial structures that you interact with? And I think financial structures, both from the tariffs that you have to charge, you mentioned nine cents per kilowatt hour on the retail side. And how then do you turn that into a, uh, the typical returns that the investors are looking for, your investors are looking for? Yeah. So uh, at the moment, the PPA is only with the EVN and it is at, at uh, the PPA price. So we're not concerned with uh, the consumer. So the, uh, they, 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 they then distribute. Um, uh, and um, uh, the, the, uh, as I already mentioned, the PPA is not considered bankable by international investors. So, so uh, lending uh, on a project, uh, project standalone basis is still a problem. In, the, in Vietnam. Uh, so in most of the banks uh, or the lenders are expecting uh, some sort of uh, parent company uh, guarantee uh, for, uh, the, for, for this project. So, the, uh, so that, that's why you find that uh, uh, the tariff is attractive here, uh, has been attractive. The, uh, the first PPA, PPA1 or PPA2 tariffs are attractive. Uh, so investors do want to come in. Uh, but there are uh, these uh, uh, constraints on the, on, uh, on lending by by international banks. Uh, local lending is available to, to some extent, uh, but uh, local debt is expensive uh, at almost uh, 10%. Uh, and so, so, where do you, uh, so, so then where do you find your investors? It, it sounds like the banks aren't willing to give money. How do you convince an investor to come in and what's your profile? <clears throat> what's your profile of an investor? Yeah, so so uh, we, we we've been in this market for a while, and uh, we've been uh, you know exploring various venues uh, avenues for investment uh, from uh, from our so basically we say uh, we, we are a fund management business. Uh, we have uh, private equity funds and public market funds. We have strong relationships with within with, with institutional investors. Uh, our investors are mostly from the U.S. Uh, and they've been supporting us uh, for from. Uh, in our funds as well as uh, various projects. Uh, so we, we've had uh, detailed discussions over the years uh, with our uh, investors. Uh, and uh, we can access bank finance, but, ba but uh, the banks will, ex will expect some kind of uh, parent company guarantee, which means that the institutional investors will have to provide guarantee for the loans. Uh, so so the, the investors have basically told us that uh, if we are expecting guarantee from us, uh, then uh, the financing cost cannot be like seven percent or eight percent. It's got to be like one or two percent. So, uh, so the 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 investors have pretty much taken on the responsibility of uh, lending us the money as well. So we we've come with a structure whereby uh, the investors use their own capability to to raise to raise the debt and provide the entire financing to us. Uh, and the, the, the way we think about it is uh, uh, by doing that, they, they save like almost 6%, uh, which is the spread between what the banks would charge uh, for, for, for the market here and uh, what it, it would cost them. Uh, the PPA is uh, is back to the US dollar, so, so you're not ca carrying any, uh, any dollar liability, so it's, which is become uh, wrong liability, which is, which is quite good. Um, so we, we are financing entirely offshore uh, at the investor level and uh, investing directly here. And uh, that, that makes the project very viable, uh, very profitable as well. 
And so <clears throat> given that these funds are, you know, private equity funds, institutional investors, do you find that they're investing in renewable energy or do you find they're investing in a rate of returns? Um, uh, uh, it's, it's both actually. So the, the investors who are supporting us for our projects uh, have interest in enabling renewable energy in Vietnam. So it's important for them to uh, to make sure that countries like Vietnam do not invest in coal power and invest in renewable energy. Uh, so uh, so they, they are prepared to support on that basis. Uh, yeah. And return is important. Uh, so uh, And also uh, ensuring that uh, a project of a high quality is developed uh, with the best equipment uh, and uh, uh, the, the highest efficiencies and uh, and all of that. So our investors are looking are looking at uh, owning these projects for life. So they're not looking at uh, developing a project with the intention of selling it, turning it on, and selling it over the next couple of years. So we we are purely looking at the cash flows that the project can generate, and um, uh, and how and is is that good enough for us uh, with the reasonable assumptions, uh, assuming that. Uh, uh, some things will go wrong in future. Maybe uh, EVN may not pay us for a, for a while. We don't know. Uh, then maybe for tell them. But we make all those assumptions, and uh, if we're happy with uh, the cash flows from uh, what we can get from this project, we're we're happy to go forward. That's great. Um, and let's talk a little bit about the fuel mix of Vietnam itself. The graph that you have here is the fuel mix, I think, for Southeast Asia. And I recall yeah. that when we were talking, Vietnam itself didn't have many coal plants at all. Is, is that correct? Everything was hydro or other renewables. Yeah, Vietnam has uh, the, the rivers running from uh, all the way from the north to the south. The Mekong River, uh, you know, flows from China to Vietnam, and uh, uh, and basically the, uh, it goes into the sea where our project is coming up. Right. Uh, so, uh, so uh, Vietnam has uh, uh, had uh, these rivers uh, over which dams have been built. Uh, so, hydro has been generating traditionally about forty to fifty percent of the power generation here. Uh, so, till recently, till recently, uh, but, but uh, now most of the uh, the dams have already been built. So, there's no more uh, room for the large scale hydro projects to be built anymore here. Uh, only run of the river small projects can come up, but not, not large scale hydro projects. Uh, so hydro has uh, is a renewable uh, energy. So uh, that was one of the reasons why uh, Vietnam has been slow in getting into wind and solar. Uh, whereas most of the Asian countries, particularly India as well, have gone into renewable energy quite early. Uh, so, but uh, Vietnam, because they had they are already in hydro, they do not have the pressure to to get into the They've been delayed late in getting into these uh, the, these other sources, uh, but now hydro potential is over. Uh, double projects are not easy to <laughs> easy to finance, uh, and uh, they had a plan for nuclear, but they scrapped it. So there is no nuclear plan at the moment, uh, and uh, uh, LNG planning is going on, but they will take a long time. So the best source of power that can come up now is uh, solar and wind, and uh, we, that's what we are, we are trying to be well positioned. Uh, to uh, to construct as many projects as possible during yeah. this time. <clears throat> yeah, it, it's funny you mentioned nuclear. That's actually the next question Carl Elliott sent yeah. over is whether nuclear was part of that industrial fuel mix under consideration. Do you know the reason why Vietnam scrapped nuclear? I, it, it was fact, scrapped after the the uh, the the, the uh, Tokyo problem. So the uh, the, the what is it Fukushima? Uh, Fukushima. Yeah. 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 So. <clears throat> Uh, after that, uh, obviously, most of the countries have turned against uh, nuclear. Uh, Germany has completely scrapped nuclear. So uh, Vietnam had a plan. They had a big plan. Uh, they've scrapped the plan. Uh, right. And uh, so one good thing about Vietnam is, uh, although it's a communist country, uh, there is a voice to the people. So people can protest here. Uh, so if, and, and the people are well-educated. So, so if, if, they, if they feel that... Uh, uh, you know, something is not good for them, uh, which is uh, you know, nuclear power or coal power in their, in their locality. They do protest, and uh, the government has to take cognizance of that. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. 
Ben Watson has another question for institutional invest investors, especially since uh, your investors are in the U.S. Do you help them with hedging of the foreign currency risk? And, uh, luckily, uh, in Vietnam, uh, they they are uh, paying us. Uh, uh, they paying us Vietnamese dong, but back to the U.S. dollar. So we don't take the currency risk. So we, we, we get yeah we, we get sufficient Vietnam dong uh, to cover for any potential uh, depreciation in the U.S. dollar, uh, and the only risk we take is that uh, the country is going to have enough foreign currency to <laughs> repatriate repatriate our capital. Uh, yep. I think they're going in the right direction. So uh, you know exports are only growing, so the, uh, I, they should have sufficient foreign exchange to allow us to repatriate capital uh, wow. when we need to. That's that's good. And what's your due diligence process when you're sourcing new projects? If you want to move to the next slide, you know, you've talked about yeah. two of your projects, one which is solar, one which is wind. What yeah. was your process to choose that those were the two that you wanted to work on? Um, so we, we are uh, building projects from ground up. So we're not buying, buying projects from third parties. So we put up a strong uh, local team. Uh, we're engaging with uh, the uh, province authorities, uh, the central authorities. Uh, and uh, we are actually uh, selecting the locations, selecting the projects, and uh, developing them uh, on our own. So we, we are quite different from a lot of foreign investors who, who just want to uh, buy projects from uh, other developers, so local developers who have developed a project at a certain level, and uh, then they would buy out. Uh, so we, we, we are identifying provinces with the best potential and the best locations and uh, uh, engaging with the province authorities. Uh, to provide the allocation for of that uh, for project location for us to do the due diligence and research. Uh, so we, we, we're looking at the availability of resource, which is very important, uh, and, uh, uh, and the feasibility of uh, construction of a project there. So you want to know that uh, uh, there are, uh, you're able to transport heavy equipment and uh, install and build a project there. Uh, so the, this is what we're looking at. Uh, in the Mekong Delta, uh, so uh, the provinces have allocated uh, uh, the sh the shallow waters of Mekong Delta uh, for, uh, for 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 the renewable energy projects, uh, which is uh, quite rare compared to our, other countries. Uh, but the reason they're doing that is uh, the, the the where the in the Mekong Delta, where the rivers uh, rivers are flowing into the sea, uh, the the waters are very shallow, so it's it's not suitable for any other uh, industrial development or tourism or any other business there. Uh, and uh, the the soil is very soft, so it's, it is simply not suitable for um, building a hotel or anything like that. Uh, and uh, the areas are quite backward, uh, so so the provinces wanted uh, some economic development there. And uh, they're, they're happy to use these uh, locations uh, which are not being used for anything else. Um, so, so we found that uh, there is a good fit here uh, because uh, putting the, it's, it's uh, close to the, it's on the shore. Uh, so we, we, we start from say 500 meters in the water to like uh, seven kilometers in the water for, 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 for our project. Mm -hmm. uh, the, it is shallow waters, but, to the, the, but the reception, the technology is good enough to be able to build the project there. Uh, right. And uh, uh, and the land, there is no land acquisition problem, so which is which is also quite nice because land, land acquisition always leads to some kind of conflict with local people. So the, in any country, it's the same. Yeah. Uh, yes, yes, so yeah, so we, we don't have the issue as well. Talk a little bit about using local expertise and international expertise. You've done business all over the world in many different countries and many different places. What's it like? How do you compare doing business in Vietnam to doing business in India, Singapore, Europe, et cetera? Right. Um, so uh, the, the, these uh, developments are new to Vietnam, uh, like large scale so solar projects or wind projects. Uh, but uh, there is sufficient local capability here. Uh, you know, the, the people are smart, educated workforce, uh, so uh, they would pick up very quickly. Uh, so it's, it's it's not necessary to to import a lot of people here except, except the experts. Uh, so the consultants and experts uh, uh, coming from uh, outside uh, anywhere in the world, uh, the Europeans, the the the, the Chinese are uh, uh, doing a lot of uh, 
EPC work here, construction work, uh, the, and even uh, the, for, for, for uh, solar projects, uh, Sterling and Wilson from India has come and done some uh, some of the uh, solar projects, built, built a few solar projects here. Uh, the Europeans are here uh, mm -hmm. uh, for, for, for the technology, for EPC, for the project management, uh, project coordination. And the, the wind projects can be quite complex uh, the, because the, the turbines that we're using are the latest turbines uh, with high capacities, uh, like four, four and a half to five megawatt uh, capacities. Uh, and they're all mostly from Europe. Uh, Vessels and Siemens are very active here and are gone from uh, Germany. Uh, so the, yeah. there, there is a strong preference from, for European equipment. Okay. Sachin Pathak asks, what percentage cost do you allocate for grid connections on a typical size solar plant? And are these grid costs changing due to the age of the grid or other upgrades to the grid? Um, so as a part of our project, uh, we are responsible for the, the transmission line and the grid connection up to the connection point. Uh, so it depends on where, where your connection point is. Uh, so for, for a solar project, the connection point is uh, like two kilometers. For the wind project, is, it is as much as 50 kilometers. So we had to build a very long transmission line. Um, so the, the grid uh, that is substation, uh, grid uh, transmission line uh, costing uh, would normally be about uh, 10, 10 to 20%, depending on uh, you know, how, how far your transmission line is, is going to be from the connection point. And as you, you know, on your website, you also mentioned that in addition to these two projects, you're targeting another thousand megawatts of development over the next five years. Where do you see that happening? Is that wind, solar, a mix of the, uh, mix of the two? Uh, it, it will be a mix of the two. Uh, we would like to do both, uh, we, uh, but it all depends on the opportunity. Uh, it depends on uh, uh, the policies. Uh, so, uh, Right now, uh, the policy for wind is quite aggressive uh, because the solar uh, solar they had they already had a FIT FIT one and FIT two and they were they both been very successful and they've got sufficient solar capacity already uh, already developed uh, so sufficient as like five gigawatt uh, but the, even that has to grow but at least they they got that uh, already the wind policy is uh, uh, expiring next year. And uh, they're expecting capacity to come up. Uh, you, you asked the question about COVID earlier. So uh, the projects which are coming up now uh, for uh, FIT next year, invent uh, are facing problem problems because of uh, COVID. There, there are delays, so the supply chain delays, uh, the equipment uh, delays. Uh, they're, they're getting sorted out, but uh, the delays have occurred. Delays of as much as uh, uh, five to six months. Uh, mm -hmm. for, for each project. Uh, so the, the, that, is, that is a cause for concern as well. Um, so uh, the, the policy for wind, uh, they, they're also expecting a, a FIT2 for, uh, for wind for up to 2023. So we think that there's going to be a good opportunity for investing into wind projects uh, until 2023. Uh, there is some uncertainty until, a, until the next policy is announced for solar. Uh, but the, the direct PPA policy, which the, they are expecting to release by the end of this year, could be a good opportunity next year. So the, the way we look at it is uh, we try to identify as many locations, as many project areas as possible, and, uh, uh, and do the groundwork to have those projects in place so that uh, as and when the policy becomes favorable, then we are, we are ready to uh, build as many projects as, as, as possible. And do you see the continuing development of these utility scale centralized renewable projects, or are you seeing competition coming from much more the decentralized, you know, local community type renewable projects? So uh, in, in Vietnam, they already have a policy for rooftop. So, so a lot of rooftop projects are coming up, uh, coming up out, out here. So the rooftop projects catering to, catering to self consumption and uh, any excess power to be released to the to EVN. Uh, so uh, there, there are quite a few rooftop, rooftop projects uh, uh, for, for businesses as well as residential. Uh, they, they are also, also coming up. Mm -hmm. 
I want to go back a little bit to the start of the Marshall Funds. Go to your slide one that you have numbered. Yeah, sure. And one of the things that's to me is interesting is how you shifted, uh, uh, yes, um, shifted your career from mechanical engineering to telecoms, and then now most of today's conversation was renewable energy. We just did a, sur a, a quick survey with the Oxford Energy people within the OVN, and I think it was about 40, over 40% 40 of the people in energy today transferred into energy, came into the energy field from somewhere else. And so given your work and your you know, career path in the last 15, 20 years or so, what were some of the transferable skills that you got in these other experiences that is now helping you develop these renewable projects? So I look at myself uh, more as an entrepreneur, uh, uh, looking for uh, opportunities uh, in, in the marketplace and trying to, uh, the, uh, trying to capture these opportunities as they, as they uh, open up. Uh, and also be useful to, to the society. Uh, so um, the, uh, I, I've done my mechanical engineering, but I've made it, never really worked as a mechanical engineer. Uh, I've been in the finance, investment banking, uh, and just investments of, of uh, in during my initial career. Uh, and then I set up business uh, initially into software because I, I felt that software was booming in India at that point of time. Uh, and that worked out quite well. And uh, then uh, uh, went on to set up the Global Tech Venture Fund uh, because again, uh, uh, tech were, were has been booming uh, early part of this decade, uh, that is early 2000s. Um, and uh, uh, our tech fund, the, the, the Global Tech Venture Fund, uh, which was set up with the, with the support of uh, an affiliate of uh, Temesec in Singapore, uh, the fund was meant to be a bridge between Silicon Valley and Asia Pacific. Uh, so we had uh, invested in several projects in Silicon Valley as well, uh, with applications in Asia, and uh, projects in uh, Asia outsourcing to USA and uh, other. Um, so uh, that that was the concept, uh, bridge between uh, Silicon Valley and Asia Pacific, the, the tech fund, and uh, uh, the 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 hedge fund we started uh, because that that was during the uh, between two two thousand to two thousand five. Uh, there was. Uh, a lot of demand for hedge, hedge funds because investors uh, were willing to, in, to invest into early stage, uh, small size uh, hedge fund entrepreneurs are wanting, uh, you know, for, uh, uh, and um, uh, the prime brokers of uh, uh, Goldman Sachs and UBS and Citigroup, uh, they've been looking around for uh, hedge funds uh, to hedge, start up hedge funds. And so we looked at it as an opportunity uh, because there was no uh, India focused hedge fund at the point of time. So we, we saw an opportunity and we got into the hedge fund business. Um, uh, so that, that worked out quite, quite well. Uh, and uh, uh, so my role is uh, as an entrepreneur is to uh, look for the opportunity and identify the business. And uh, then once the business uh, uh, gets into a steady state, then uh, my colleagues would run it. So I won't run it anymore. So, uh, so in, in uh, uh, so uh, in our uh, hedge fund business, uh, again, uh, all the investors were from Europe and USA. Uh, so after two, 2008, uh, because there's been a bit of a lull in the business in 2008 from the fundraising side. Uh, so uh, I thought that that was a good time to move to London because uh, uh, most of our investors were from Europe and USA. Uh, and it's better for, for me to be closer to the investors there. So that that's, that was one of the reasons uh, for my uh, relocation to yeah, to to London. And uh, the, when I was in London, I uh, I found that uh, uh, the uh, I I I uh, I basically looked at the renewable energy business as uh, uh, the new growth area, uh, in a, and a business which is really required, particularly in Asia, uh, to address mm -hmm. the sustainable energy needs. So so that 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 was my. Uh, reason for getting into this business. Yeah, and I think bringing those specific skills that you were talking about in doing the technology selection, doing the hedge funds, really helped them hone in to wind development, solar development, as all the skill sets were pretty much accumulated. In. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's, a, it's, a, it's also important to marry the finance uh, with the technology. Uh, so I, 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 I can understand technology, whether it's uh, wind or solar or uh, electronics or telecommunications with a bit of effort. Uh, but the important thing is to 
budget with uh, finance uh, to find the right financial instruments to uh, to find the right investors and convince them to uh, be a part of this project. Uh, yeah. So, so my role is both uh, due diligence as well as uh, uh, for finding the right fit for the investors. Yeah, and so talking about due diligence of these projects again, Sachin Pathak asks, "What are your views then on projects that are?" Um, self-sustaining island grid systems, such as for remote communities and to support people that are off-grid. The two that we're talking about right now have all been plugged into the larger interconnects. Do you yeah. see a development of these off-grid communities and uh, what are your thoughts on those? Uh, I'm sure there, 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 would be, uh, there, there would be the demand for off-grid facilities as well. Uh, but that, that would be, uh, the, the, the demand would be uh, perhaps uh, uh, not on a large scale, uh, large scale uh, area. So uh, we we are, we are uh, our, our focus is on addressing large scale energy needs of the country. Uh, so they are therefore focus on large uh, large projects. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's a niche for those smaller scale projects that one of the entrepreneurs on this call might be able to take up, or would you recommend people against it for some reason or another? Uh, no, I, I, I don't think. I, I think there is uh, uh, there is a lot of value to that to, to that business as well. Uh, like for instance, uh, uh, we are uh, focused on utility scale, large scale solar projects and wind projects. Uh, but um, uh, there are a lot of people here in Vietnam who are uh, only focusing on rooftop. So in in, in rooftop, uh, each project is a, could be a small project. We only have half a megawatt to. 300 kilowatts uh, to over one megawatt or two megawatt for the for the factory, uh, but you you can aggregate all of them and build a business. Uh, so th there are some funds uh, focusing on that area as well. Mm, okay, where do you think is the biggest need for future expertise? Um, so uh, the 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 next phase <laughs> that that we are we are we, we are seeing is. Uh, uh, once uh, the good sites uh, for these uh, for the wind uh, and large and uh, quite a bit of solar also comes up, uh, the next expansion is going to be in the sea. Uh, so offshore, uh, and offshore energy is also uh, you know uh, being talked about here quite a lot. So it's uh, some of the big big uh, companies like uh, Macquarie, GIG, uh, even. Uh, um, Orsted and uh, the, the big European uh, offshore wind energy companies uh, are interested in uh, uh, looking for potential for uh, deep sea projects, you know, deep offshore projects. Uh, so the, the the good thing about the deep offshore is uh, uh, the wind capacity factor can be as much as sixty to seventy percent. So mm -hmm. you, you can pretty much get a firm power uh, compared to uh, intermittent energy that uh, uh, projects on the land can provide. So the land projects uh, can, uh, can run at uh, 30 to 40% capacity factor, whereas uh, the projects in the deep sea can be 60 to 70%. Uh, but, well, but then the deep sea projects can be very expensive. So the initial projects will be high cost uh, and the, the, uh, the buyer will have to be, they should be prepared to pay that high cost. The, yeah, the, the transmission to get it back to shore is going to yeah, be much more exactly, expensive, yeah, yeah. much more lossy exactly. from an energy point of view. Yeah, yeah, the, the, that's right. Yeah. And, you know, when you are mentoring young entrepreneurs, you know, early professionals, what are some common issues that you see them facing that you, and how do you advise them to overcome those challenges? Uh, so, uh, I, 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 entrepreneurship is is never easy, as <laughs> as you probably know. So, uh, uh, but but um, uh, the, the the main thing is your value proposition uh, has to be uh, consistent with uh, the needs of the market uh, and uh, well, the skill sets that you can provide to make the make the business successful, and uh, the projects to be uh, well funded as well. So the, uh, but uh, compared to where, when I was starting business uh, in the late 90s, uh, there, there is a very good ecosystem of uh, investors, angel investors and uh, early stage funds 
so if your value proposition is uh, is quite good, it's possible to get funding these days, uh, but much easier than what it used to be before. So mm -hmm. it's, it is a it's a good time to be an interviewer. Oh, that's very good to know. Um, and I think I will give the last question to Brian Stewart here. And if we think back through your career of all the different types of infrastructures you've helped finance, with climate change preparedness uh, coming up very rapidly and also investors needing an ROI, do you see wind and solar developments inherently more risky to develop or less risky to develop in order to meet both of those goals? Hmm. Right. Uh, I, I mean, uh, the, the wind and solar projects, the, these are uh, utility scale uh, power projects. Uh, they're not meant to be risky. Right? So, so they, they, are, they are meant to be, uh, you know, uh, regular, um, uh, regular return, uh, reasonable return, uh, low risk uh, projects. Uh, so uh, I think that's uh, that situation continues. So the, the the investors uh, are in the sector because these these are uh, predictable, reasonable return uh, projects. Uh, the technology is very well established. Uh, the, a, a, uh, you can be sure that uh, um, a properly uh, configured and installed wind power project uh, can run for twenty to thirty years quite easily. So the, that has been demonstrated over the years. Uh, so uh, institutional investors are uh, prepared to fund these projects. Uh, they're happy to, uh, these projects are bankable as far as the technology is concerned. Uh, then it's, it's a question of uh, uh, finding the right fit uh, in, the, in the market that you are that you are trying to exploit. Great. Any last words? Uh, uh, so the, uh, the, the renewable energy, sustainable de development uh, business uh, is here for, for the long term. Uh, it's only going to grow. Like the, 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 the chart I've, sh I've shown, uh, if, uh, yeah, this chart basically shows, shows that uh, uh, if countries have to maintain the CO2 levels uh, and uh, limit global warming, a lot of wind and solar power needs to come up. And as this capacity in, keeps increasing, costs will come down. So therefore, more capacity will come up. Uh, so uh, as per this chart, 70% of the new power generation should be wind and solar if we have to maintain the, uh, the, the kind of uh, uh, CO2 levels uh, as, as of today. So there is a lot of opportunity. Uh, you got to be there and be patient <laughs> with, uh, with uh, building the projects. The, uh, uh, building a, uh, a uh, utility scale um, uh, project is not easy. It takes time. <laughs> so we've been on our uh, Vietnam projects for the last three years. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. So, uh, so it, it takes time to get your credibility in the market and uh, uh, get comfortable with uh, with. with or with all the uh, agencies involved. Uh, right. So, uh, yeah, but there is a lot of opportunity and uh, 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 entrepreneurship in the sector. Well, Murthy, thank you so much for your time today and to uh, chat with the group here. Uh, I think we all really appreciate it. Thanks, Jimmy. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thanks for joining the, the call. All right. Today. Take care. Okay. And okay. see you Thanks. next time. Okay. Yeah. Bye.